Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, February 11th, 2016, and this is the Week in Charts. Once again, the Week in Charts is brought to you by me. Here we go. Uh, this is my uh, banner ad for my trading service. And if you want to get started, it's, it's $47. You could also uh, get started with the delay version, and I'll see if we could, uh, I'll see if I could find you that on my new website. We'll get a chance. Anyway, there's a disclaimer screen. Let's just sum it up really quickly here. All predictions are about the future. And, of course, a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Hey, new this week, I did a redo my website. So let me just show you that real quick, if you don't mind. Um, I actually eliminated new this week on the website, ironically. But let me see if I can get that up and, up and running for you. So here's the site, and if you come up here, it's a couple of new things, additions. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but right here on the blog, I started separating things out into video updates, the weekend charts, and then also I did want to show you down here, there's a discretionary, a video of discretion, and I'm going to break this down in a few more details but anyway if you scroll all the way down you'll get all the way down to the content towards the bottom and there's you can see video updates there and podcasts and also obviously random thoughts so if you're looking for all the commentary now it's going to all be on the blog and then hopefully in time i'll get it uh, a lot more it's already a lot more cleaned up than it was but hopefully it'll be a lot better uh soon anyway let's uh hop back into the slides now i did a video on uh, yesterday, in fact, or the setups that uh, I chose and why I chose them. And you can find that on my website down towards the bottom, if you scroll down to the bottom. So check that out after the show, obviously. And I was going to spend a lot of time during the webinar talking about those setups, but I figured since I already made a video yesterday, just go ahead and check out that video when you get a chance. And also, if you get a chance, if you go back uh, to um, – a few weeks, if you go to my YouTube channel and look under the list of um, videos, and I'm telling this for you people live, I guess what I could do is just put a link in it uh, when I uh, publish this. But if you go back a couple of weeks, I did a video on how to catch a top in six easy steps, and that could also be how to catch a bottom. So if you watch that video and then watch this little five-minute or six-minute video here, then it's going to make a lot of sense as to what I saw and what I look for in those emerging trend patterns. So check that out, uh, first chance you get. Now, let's take a look at the African Queen. Now, the reason I have the African Queen in here is a lot of times what I see with people is I call it African Queen Syndrome, and I've talked about this before. And in the African Queen, the movie, and it was a good movie, by the way, and it was uh, Bogart and Hepburn, and... It's kind of a long story, but they were essentially trying to get down to the to the lake, and they went through rapids, and uh, natives shot at them, and Germans shot at them, and I don't know if natives shot at them, but anyway, they had mosquitoes and leeches and all kinds of things, and they felt like if they got down to the lake, they'd be home free, and then, as I wrote in the layman's guide to trading stocks, the camera pans back, and they're like, within yards or feet of the lake and they gave up and this is the actual african queen that was used in the movie this is down in um not in key west i think it's in key largo and this is uh, i actually took this picture myself went down there um as i've said last time I, I talked about this i spare no expenses for this um for these web shows so i had to fly down there and get a picture of it but anyway that's the actual boat uh they actually give tours of the boat but it was it was butt cold there, so we decided it was too cold to go. Now, the reason I say this is just like Bogey and Hepburn, the reason most people fail trading is that they don't stick with a methodology to its fru fruition. Fruition, easy for me to say. They, they try something for a while, and they have some sort of success, maybe a little success, maybe no success. They give up. They go off to chase rainbows. And trust me, my methodology is not a perfect one. And I, 
I was told years ago by Peter Mothy, he invited me to Dallas to speak to a group of um, investors over there. And I talked about the methodology. And one of the things I talked about was the fact that it can be streaky. And you have to chip away at it for quite a while. And then all of a sudden, bam, you print money. And that's just how it works. And I haven't solved for that. And that's something to do with momentum. And I don't think I'll ever solve for that because I've been working on that for about 15 years, uh, that particular part, that one thing. And so far, I haven't solved for it. Um, and now that brings me back to discussions I had many years ago with Larry Connors, and we were talking about the same thing. That was over 15 years ago. So I don't know the answer to that. If I did, you, you might not ever see my fat ass again. But uh, Peter Mothy told me to stop saying streaky. But for lack of a better word, I, I can't – I don't know how to explain it. And as I often say, and I think I said last night in my video update for the trading service, I said – it's, it kind of reminds me of sailing back in my sailboat days. Uh, sailing is best described as hours of boredom interrupted by brief moments of sheer panic. And, and I certainly can attest to that. We nearly sank on the way to Bermuda one time. So trading is a lot like that. It, and it is pretty boring. And then all of a sudden, a lot of things happen. And I think right now, well, I know right now, we're in that a lot of things happen type of time frame. The market got choppy last year and as you know or if you look at the service archives you can see that we had quite a few setups for a while we had quite a few setups and then all of a sudden we didn't see these setups for a while so we just stopped trading and we only took a setup if it really really looked good and if you go back and watch the the um week in charts you'll see i'm showing the uh the audio is okay sometimes a squirrel gets uh his nuts caught in the wire uh, in between me and you, and that's when the uh, when the audio goes out. So let me um, – yeah, it says it's still working. Anyway, um, so at, at worst-case scenario, the recordings uh, work fairly well. So what happens is people get in, and I've showed the, the slide before where I have a nice little chart. looks like this of the S&P 500, and uh, thank you, David. And then it starts doing this. And then somebody on this particular day here, the exact freaking high, says, bravo for your system. And that's an exact quote. And then somewhere over here, he tells me how bad I suck. And this is the same guy. And I see this happen all the time. Of course, what happened here, market does this again. So just like Bogey and Hepburn gave up, like right when they almost got there, that's how trading momentum is. What's the uh, what's the old story? Ten feet from gold or whatever. Um, this this these ex explorers went out and they bought all this equipment and they dug and they dug and they dug and they dug and they gave up. And somebody bought the equipment for pennies of the dollar, and then they dug an extra ten feet. Probably took them an extra hour or whatever, and they hit this massive gold find, one of the biggest gold veins, I think, in the United States history. So Google that for a little information on that. And it's kind of the same thing. And I see this process over and over again. And, and I was thinking this morning, if I didn't give a shit, I could pardon my French, uh, as my French friend says. That's English, Dave. But if I didn't give a shit, I could probably make a lot more money in the educational side. I spent a lot of time trying to help people to just – stay with things and then tough it out and wait for those good times with the methodology. And that goes for any methodology as I'm going to discuss in just a minute. And instead of spending that time, I probably could do some marketing or something and, and just get new clients in because I realize that, you know what, there's going to be a huge turnover and people to go off to chase rainbows. But maybe I'm a little altruistic in thinking that I could get clients that will stay longer term and will get it longer term and will reap the fruits of their labor. And I had a guy I talked to years ago about marketing. Nothing ever worked out with him. But I told him about a few of my clients that I just absolutely love, that have been with me forever. And he says, that's a pipe dream, David. That's the, Most people are going to go through six people before you and six people after you. They're just going to stop by briefly. So stop thinking that way. Stop thinking you're going to get a client to stick longer term, to stick with the methodology, to do what you do. But you know what? I'm not giving up, okay? And again, I probably would make a lot more money on the educational side of my business if I did and just focused on getting new clients in and not keeping clients. But that's the biggest problem that I see. People quit right before things get good. You've seen me do quite a few columns and videos 
titled these are the ones we've been waiting for which is a, a stole a line from uh, somebody who said we are the ones we've been waiting for or whatever some silly line years ago but right now these are the ones we've been waiting for and I see it happen over and over again and one of the stories that I tell quite often it I wrote this in the layman's guide to trading stocks I had a client years ago and he was with the service and he did okay for a while and then he, things got a little choppy for a while and then he just said you know what I'm forget this okay he gave up and then he was still he still had some subscription left and about a month later he logs in and he sees this wonderful looking portfolio and he called me up and he said Dave I feel like I was engaged to be married and I decided to break it off and the next Saturday my fiance won the lottery and I've seen that happen over and over again and, and, and I'm getting emails from people now and they're like hey Dave stop picking on me and I'm like no I'm not picking on you in particular because there's a lot of people like you are emailing me right now they're like damn it I gave up and now I'm looking at it and everything's working great now I can't guarantee this will always happen but I can guarantee that the only way you're gonna make money trading is to capture a trend you have to sell higher than you buy or you have to cover lower than you short period that's the only way to ever make money on a trade you have to capture a trend write that down okay next time you try to pick a top pick a bottom or trade some kind of choppy market system or whatever you have to capture a trend so sometimes that means sitting on your hands sometimes that means taking a little stab here and there and getting stopped out of a position while you're waiting for conditions to improve so again not to beat the dead horse but I call that African Queen syndrome a lot of people give up at the absolute worst possible time by the way I don't believe in timing and methodology I'm getting a little further ahead of myself than I should right now but I don't believe in timing and methodology and that's the problem I'm seeing right now is uh, a couple of days ago I said hey uh, what do you think you you ready to come in come back in are you ready to renew whatever and they're like no Dave I don't see any setups in the foreseeable future and it's like well I didn't see any either but it's like you know I'm gonna grind it out every day and guess what I had so many setups last night I was here till seven o'clock last night trying to figure out which setups to go with and I ended up going with three and I was thinking about going with five setups for today now sometimes we don't have any so you never know when that trend is going to come in and I wish you I wish there was times where I could say you know what it's not gonna work for a while it hasn't been working it's probably not gonna continue working and I'll go off, I could go off on vacation and enjoy myself instead of taking that laptop with me and grinding it out uh, to the uh, frustration of my wife sometimes but grinding out that analysis every day you have to work at it you have to stick with it because and I hate to say it again and I know Peter Moffey's gonna be mad at me but it's streaky and you never know when those next big trades have come along now let me interview myself are these three trades that I have down here going to work out I don't know okay or they're gonna be the next three biggest winners I don't know but if just one of them takes off this could make my entire year okay and that's the thing about trading momentum you just have to keep chipping away at it now and again I'm getting a little further ahead of myself but I can't talk about other people's methodologies but if you wrap your head around the methodology and you learn the methodology and it's a good methodology and you prove it to yourself then by all means follow it until you reap the fruits of your labor and I'm gonna come back to that in just one second this is the actual open portfolio there is a uh, I want to talk a little bit about it. I did a short video on my website but I want to elaborate on that uh, using a little discretion uh, we had a profit target of 72 on this one and again I'm not going to go through all the details on this but we're looking for uh, based on a hypothetical and I got to say that for legal purposes 100 account K account 2% 2,000 per trade so we're looking for 1,000 on the first low and then hopefully some big number on the second loaf meaning the second half of the trade now you could see that we're right about a thousand in the first loaf because the initial profit target was hit but if you look at the video on my website and then what I'm getting ready to show you I'm going to show you how to squeeze out a lot more money out of this particular trade on that first half of the trade and it's like I'm reluctant to give out mechanical results because it works so much better with a little bit of discretion and this is something that I teach and I showed it in real time yesterday 
And a lot of times I'll warn ahead of ahead of time because we ha we'll have, let's say, a stock is really close to being stopped out the next day. It's like, guys, or that night, I'll say, the guys, it's going to get stopped out in the open, but let that stop get hit. And then if you're disciplined, wait a few minutes and then put that stop back in. And a lot of times you can stay with a winning trade that they just try to shake you out of. Now, that's not what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about um, a, a good part of of using discretion. But anyway, so just uh, remember, this was our initial profit target was 72. We'll come back to this one in just a few minutes. So getting back to the methodology thing. I'm sorry, I've got a little mixed up on you, but uh, this uh, technical difficulties kind of threw me a little bit, kind of iced the kicker here, but I'll get it back. Don't worry. <laughs> but keep in mind that with any methodology, there's going to be good times and there's going to be bad times. OK. And I don't care what that methodology is. Now, it's not my way or highway, as I often preach. And I know some I know some of you in here personally, some of your clients of of me now that have have been through this, as some people call it, the game of mean reversion. It's it's you know if it wasn't for mean reversion trading, I probably wouldn't have half of my clients. So I, I better quit beating up on mean reversion trading. But in theory, mean reversion trading is like you just buy when it's low and you sell when it's high, and that's beautiful as long as the market does that. But what happened last summer and what happened recently? Okay, that proverbial dog on a leash you know you walk in a dog on a leash it goes from one side to the next and i don't know who came up with that analogy originally so i've just been using it and if somebody knows who came up with that originally i'd love to give them credit but i i don't remember where i read it or heard it uh and it might have been something i learned way back in the trading market days in, in the late 90s but anyway it's like that proverbial dog walking a leash it kind of meanders back and forth and then all of a sudden sees a squirrel or something the leash breaks or you breaks out of your hand and then it takes off. So mean reversion trading, the, the lure of it, the beauty of it is it works beautifully for a while and then it blows up. So if you could wrap your head around that, knowing that you're going to have 11 really good months and then one shitty day <laughs> that might wipe out those 11 good months, I can't personally do it. But if you could do that, then maybe – you could trade that way. It's just not for me. And I've had it, it is uh, one of the guys that was in the show, uh, Wiz Matthew Buckley, I think is his name, uh, said, you know, as, as a three drink minimum, if you want me to tell you some some mean reversion stories. So trust me, I've been there, done that, and I have the T-shirt, and that's one reason why I'm so adamant against it. Even though, again, it's not my way or highway. Now, with that said, if you're willing to live with that, then that's fine. Okay. So you have to stick with the methodology long enough to reap your fruit, reap the fruits of your labor. In my case, with trend following, you might have to sit on your hands for a while. And sometimes that while could be a fairly long while. I'm trying to get everybody to look at everything longer term and not focus so much on the day to day. Like Livermore said, the chap who expects the market to give him a daily paycheck, like wages, like weekly wages or daily wages, whatever, um, is a uh, I forget how he said it. He said it more eloquent than I did. But anyway, it's like that you can't expect the market to give you a paycheck. And, and the mean reversion stuff looks like it gives you a paycheck until it doesn't. The trend following stuff doesn't give you a paycheck until it does. So we're actually, as a friend of mine said years ago, uh, he's a CTA, or at least was a CTA. He says, Dave, we're playing for that outlier. We're actually playing for that big, large move as opposed to the market stay within a range. We're looking for that outlier move, that big move which wipes out the mean reversion guys, the so-called black swan move. Uh, we're actually looking for that. And I think, again, the, the problem that I see is everyone is so short-sighted. The problem with being short-sighted is I have people that have come and gone for – the last 15 years, and the reason I keep using that 15-year time frame is that's the time frame that I've been public or very public in what I what I do. I guess in 1995, technically, I did um, – I guess I was sort of public then because that's when my first article went out. And then in within a few years, I was with trading market. So 15 years or more, I should say, in my public trading life. But I've seen people struggle for that long 
of a period of time because they just keep they they try a little bit and they give up they try a little bit and they give up they don't stick with things long enough they end up perpetually out of phase and so I need to try to figure out a way to encourage people to be a trader for life and it's not again it's not my way or highway if you're doing something different from me that's fine but just stick with it and do it and do it for life and be good at it okay in your in your life, you're successful. How do I know? Well, because you're not going to be spending time on a Thursday to learn about something, okay? You you would, if you had the time, you would be off goofing off, right? So I know you're motivated. I know some of you personally. I see an engineer in here. I see a doctor in here. Uh, and I see a dog trainer in here. He's a famous dog trainer, by the way, uh, who off, who's, off, who's also a coffee ro roaster too, right, Craig? Um, I'll give a shout out to your website if you want. Just uh, throw the link up there. So we have all these people who've been successful in their businesses and everything, and they approach these businesses with with uh, I don't want to use with a plan. I think is what the word I'm looking for. Okay, and they stick with it, and they don't expect to be profitable day one. But when it comes to trading, not necessarily you guys, but a lot of people come in. And they just kind of go at it willy-nilly. And it's serious business, okay? You should treat it like anything else in life. You should be serious about it. And you should dedicate a big portion of your life to it. And if you don't have the time to do that, and you're just kind of fascinated with it, then by all means, pay me to do it for you, okay? Or, I'm sorry, pay me to do the analysis for you. i got to be careful. I'm no longer registered uh, as, as anything, so I've got to be careful how I say that. So pay me to do the analysis for you, and I'll be happy to do that homework. Uh, my favorite traders are busy traders, and the most successful traders I know are busy traders, the doctors who are too busy saving lives to spend a whole lot of time day trading or micromanaging and doing all these other things that you shouldn't be doing, provided you're following my methodology, of course. They tend to be successful because – they only trade when opportunities present itself, okay? And they're okay with me saying, hey, don't do anything because the market's choppy. So they, they log in, they check the service, they watch a five-minute video, they're like, oh, Dave says market's choppy, doesn't have any setups, well, I'm, I'm busy tomorrow anyway, I've got to save some lives. And they go off and save lives. So, but again, don't be short-sighted. I'm trying to make the point that you really want to be a trader for life, if that's what you choose to do. If you choose it to be a trader, then be a trader for life. And don't try to time a methodology and make sure you stick with the methodology, any methodology, long enough to reap the fruits of your labor. Now, I've showed this slide quite a few times, and this is my point is that if you get better at one, you get better at all. So once you start believing more in your methodology, then guess what? That belief, those beliefs are reinforced, okay? So this is mind. Or psychology so you feel better about it and then guess what your position and your money management gets better why well because you've gotten better at picking good stocks okay and when you do get that bad stock not if when you do get that bad stock in your portfolio you're like oh let's just kick this mofo out because he's losing money for me and he's taking up a slot where I can put another winner in so you follow your money management so you follow your money management, you get rid of that loser, you're holding on to your winners, and guess what? You get another winner to put in that slot. And you can see how the three are intertwined, and you become better and better at trading. Now, I woke up this morning thinking how just the opposite happens from a psychological standpoint. And how fragile everything is, and how things can deteriorate really fast so you get into that choppy market and you're trying to trade momentum and you start losing money so what do you do well you begin to lose faith in the methodology so you feel like your methodology begins to crumble and then you get depressed about things okay and then this is where you start doing stupid things like holding on to losers too long and losing money and as you lose money that whole thing begins to unwind. Then psychologically you become more depressed. And then you really start to doubt the methodology. Okay. 
And then a lot of times what happens in the downward spiral is it's like you just you just sort of start gambling and you completely throw the money management out and your psychology is you you've you've taken on this gambling persona and then the methodology is completely thrown out the window so what happens next everything begins to crash okay so i hate to phrase it in a negative way but that's exactly what i see is that we get into these choppy markets and you know what they suck for me too Okay, uh, who was it? Was it Eckhart or somebody at a market wizard said three months out the year, you're hot. You're so hot, you can't sleep. You're wondering when the trend is coming to an end. I can't sleep lately. Maybe that's why, because I'm hot right now. Okay, three months out a year, you're cold. You're so darn cold, you wonder if you're ever going to make money again because you're cold. You just you can't hit the side of the board. And then the other six months of the year, you grind it out, make a little, lose a little, make a little, lose a little. And you wonder if you're ever going to consistently make money again. And that's the life of a trader. Okay. And it never gets easy, but I can promise you that it gets easier as you get more and more experience. My first bear market, I mean, I had the Asian crisis. And that was a bit of a, a shot across the bow that you could lose money trading. I think it was the Asian crisis. It was something in the 90s. And then the bear market of 2000, that was kind of like, whoa, wait a minute. And luckily, during the bear market of 2000, I was friends with a lot of successful uh, older traders who'd been around through bear markets before, been around through like the 70s where it just kind of chopped around. And it's like they just started shorting stocks. They got out there long, sort of shorting. I'm like, you could do that? It's like, <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, you know, it, it, you follow the market. And that's and that some time around that point in time, I became the trend following moron because I just followed along. But it did help me to have other people show me how to do that. BarkingSquirrelCoffee.com. BarkingSquirrelCoffee.com is, uh, is Craig's website for his coffee. So check that out. You get a chance. And uh, uh, shoot me a, an email to remind me next Thursday or next Wednesday, and I'll put that in the chart show. That uh, I'll let you uh, – uh, I'll give you a discount on spots from your show. Now, any questions and, – and I see there's a few questions coming in, a few thoughts. But before we get into uh, – a discretionary example. Let's talk a little bit. Uh, let's answer some of these questions and let me know if there's anything else you want to know. Phil says, Dave, you're not in sync with the market portfolio down today when market trash because setups all trigger before the sell off. LOL. Yeah. You know, Phil, that's an interesting point. I know Phil's giving me a hard time. Phil's, a, um, Phil's one of my favorite clients. He's a guy who knows what's going on. He knows when things are good. He knows when things are bad, et cetera. But that's a hard thing too. It's like sometimes your portfolio, you got a really good portfolio and the market's doing one thing and your portfolio is doing the other. Now I'm not watching every tick right now. I've got screens closed down to do the webinar, but I know that sometimes we'll make a lot of money on the short side and then all of a sudden the market is a big sell off. Well, the reason we're not making a, a lot of money on the big sell off is because we already made our money. Okay on the minor sell-off. So that's the thing you have to realize. And you gotta be really careful. I know Phil's joking, but you gotta be really careful not to look at the day by day and try to pick it apart and put some logic to it. My favorite example of that, which I talked about years ago, we were short a little biotech stock. I think it was NBIX, if memory serves. And we were we made profits or we, we had a, a minor profit for, for about two days. And then a day come along, it, I think we were up like maybe two points, and then it rallied like two points in one day. So we were back to a scratch or a minor loss. I forget exactly what it was. And I got an email from a client, and usually an email from a client is a microcosm. Just like I said earlier, someone's like, uh, well, I don't know if I mentioned it or not, but somebody earlier today emailed me like, hey, thanks for making fun of me and your service last night. And I'm like, no, it's not you. Trust me, I've gotten a dozen emails lately from people. So it's it's not you that's no longer following the system and then logs in and sees everything's working great. It's quite a few of you. So the the point is, what is the point? <laughs> oh, the point is in the in the day to day analysis, you can't micromanage it. And in this particular case, somebody emailed me and said, "Well, I'm getting out because." The stock is up. It was a short. And the market was down. It should be down. Well, 
the market doesn't always move in your time frame, as you know, and it doesn't always move in sync with the overall market either, your positions, that is. And then what happened? The, the stock literally halved the next day. So it was, a, it was the biggest winner we had, I think, of the year, or at least up until that point. And it all happened overnight. Now, following your plan, I don't want to get too forward to follow your plan because that's not today's lecture. But following your plan as opposed to trying to put logic into it and try to micromanage the position would have obviously been a thing to do. <laughs> Trading markets when you need a live webcam is fun. Yeah, I was thinking about that just yesterday. I have the studio in my office now. Um, I'm, in fact, I'm looking at it uh, over, to, over my monitors. And it was kind of fun when I had the, uh, the actual live webcam. So it would be fun to put the cam on um, again. Okay, Ooh, a lot of questions coming in. Yeah, keep them coming. Uh, hi, Dave. Have you looked at increasing trade size during a trend and decreasing during the bad times while keeping the methodology, taking setups, doing both? No, 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 because here's the problem with that. On every trade that I go into, I'm, I think going in, that this might be the mother of all setups, that I'm going to make a lot of money on this setup. Now, every now and then I might have a setup at an ETF and I'm like, okay, guys, we're just getting exposure to this sector. That's the exception to the norm. On every setup I go into, I think this stock has the potential to be in the mother of all trends. And if you go back and look at those shorts and you go back, you could get, you could, Watch it all free. I have the delayed service. You can get it for free. And all those archives are there going back to the original day I recommended them. And it, as you follow those stocks, you'll know that a lot of days as they begin to develop, I'm like, okay, guys, this $60 stock, I think it has a potential to go to 30 So on every trade, I think it has potential, regardless of the market conditions. Now, two points. If you scale back, and I did try that years ago as an experiment, and it failed absolutely miserably because that's where, once again, I'm like, okay, let's interject logic into this market. It's not great conditions, so let's just take little trades. Okay, well, what happened? Those little trades started to work. Conditions improved. We started taking big trades. What happened is big trades didn't work. So now you made a little bit of money, and you lost a lot of money. And that you got absolutely, you've gotten absolutely nowhere. In fact, you've actually lost ground. So your best defense is a good offense. So pick the best stocks to begin with. That's why I did soft sell here. That's why I did an entire course just on how to pick stocks. And it took me 14 hours to cover that. So pick those best stocks going in. Now, how do you throttle back in bad times? You throttle back in bad times because the database is not going to produce that many setups. And if you go look at that little video I just did, You'll see, which is now, again, at the bottom of my website. I'm pointing to the bottom of my website like you can see me. Maybe I do need to turn that webcam back on again, huh? <laughs> um, but if you watch that video, you'll see where I talked about how the database tells me what to do. And, and that's very important. Dathan says, Dave, what I learned about myself and my previous failures, trading is the emotional part of trading. Amen. Amen. The need to be right at every trade, absolutely. And fighting the, quote, get rich quick emotion is what has derailed me through the years. Boy, I tell you, I need to quote you on this. This is beautiful. Uh, thanks for sharing. I had to study, study, study micro and macro economic and show myself over and over how markets work to settle myself down and follow my plan. Amen. Let me stop you right there. Go in and look at the bear market of 2000. Go in and look at the bear market of 2008. Okay, bear market of 2000, the NASDAQ lost 70% of its value. I feel like that guy who screams on TV now. 70% of its value. Okay? The S&P 500 in 2008 lost over half of its value. As I preach over and over again, I tell people markets go up and markets go down. And they look at me like I pooed my pants, kind of like the same look they give you 
when you go to Starbucks and just ask for a cup of coffee, you know, I used to have to bring a teenager with me to Starbucks and say, okay, I want a cup of coffee and I want like, uh, I want to put some cream in it, some sugar. It's like, all right, dad, I got this. Um, brewed up, room for cream. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, what she said. That's what I want. I want a cup of coffee. <laughs> but anyway, so markets go up, markets go down. People look at you like you're crazy. But when you tell them that it might be going down, all of a sudden, they begin to reason why it's not going to go down. And that was, a, again, I keep going back to the first, my first real bear market, and not just an Asian crisis or long-term capital management or anything like that. My first real bear, real bear market was like, this. these stocks are being taken behind the woodshed and getting the crap beat out of them. So the reason these stocks were so high was because people just thought they were great and there's overvalued and there maybe there's no substance behind them, okay? Or maybe something's going to change in the future that these people are foreseeing and they just want to get out of the way. In other words, there's people behind these little price bars and these people are emotional creatures just like me. All right, got sidetracked on that. Let's finish the uh, quote here. It is still hard, even to this day, attending trainings like yours and rereading your book each week helps me control my emotions better each week. As a result, my portfolio is up 11.13%, 11.3% this year. Thank you for sharing. And, 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 you know, that's secret. That's a secret, if there is a secret, is study, study, study. And I don't want to go off on a tangent on this because I've actually talked longer than I thought I would on all this, but you know me, I get, you wind me up, Chief Orman. Uh, but I'll get emails from people saying, hey, Dave, I got this system. And, and please, I'm going to ask you nicely, don't email me your system, okay? Uh, if your system is very close to mine or, or like I know Phil over there is doing a little something with the 50-day moving average, that's cool, okay? That's fine. But don't email me some system and expect me to endorse it or get excited about it. Unless you want me to really pick it apart. And if you really want me to do that, you're going to have to pay me because that's that's the least favorite thing I want to do. I just don't have time to do that, okay? I have my own system I worked on for 20-something years. It'll probably be 30 years soon here. And I'm still working on it, okay? And that's how long it takes sometimes to really find something, unfortunately. Maybe not quite so long. But you have to, again, dedicate your life to it. And the point I'm trying to make is you have to – be willing to pick apart your own system and you have to be willing to say what could go wrong and it's amazing like I said I wouldn't digress but here I go somebody sent me a system had a 40% drawdown and it, was, it would only make like 1% of trade then it had a 40% drawdown so and I forget the exact numbers but it was something ridiculous like that where we take like 40 trades to make back that one loss or that string of losses and they're like yeah but by the end of the year it was profitable well, this is all in hypothetical land because it was all based on back data and not real data. I mean, I'm sorry, not real live conditions. So could you really have survived that nearly lose, losing nearly half of your money and then have it come back? I don't know. Maybe you can. But be darn sure that, that you're convinced that your methodology works. And you could do that two ways. One – through empirical evidence and real-time evidence, and more importantly, that empirical historical evidence. Go back and look at those charts and see what worked, see what didn't, and why. All right, before I digress too far, institutions are a different breed of cat. Okay, I don't know what you're going with. I don't know why you're saying that, but what's kind of interesting is, oh, here we go. Here's a question. Dave, my confusion is behind the bars are people versus institution. Okay, that's a great question, and I thought about that. Where does an institution get their money? Anyone? Okay, let's say let's call a mutual fund an institution. Where does a mutual fund get their money? From people, right? People. Good answer, Joe. So, okay, uh, my daughter's at college. It costs a bloody fortune. I need money to pay my daughter's tuition. The market is going down. 
if I let that market go down much further, I'm not going to be able to pay my daughter's tuition. So what do I do? I sell my, I sell my mutual fund. Okay. So if there's a lot of other bees out there with daughters and sons in college or people getting divorces or people buying houses or whatever the case may be, then their selling is going to force a mutual fund to sell to raise cash to pay the people. Okay. Now, let's just say that they're okay. Well, well there's this institution that's in and of itself, an institution. Okay. And they don't have any people invested in them. Well, you've got some emotional trader there, okay? And you'd be surprised, just because they're quote-unquote sophisticated doesn't mean that they won't get emotional and bail out, okay? So no matter what, it's still a human behind the bar. Well, well Dave, what about the high-frequency trading? Well, there's still humans behind that. Didn't the, the humans pull the plug a while back and – you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't worry about any of that kind of stuff that you can't control because eventually that's going to get washed out through the system. And whenever I think technical analysis might stop working, not that I ever do, but I just see people do dumb things and people get emotional and all. And that makes me realize that technical analysis, as long as there are people in the markets, will still work. Bears are great as long as you're on the right side. As you say, things slide faster than they glide. Yeah, pilot told me that that's incorrect, but I tried to because a glide means you're going down, but uh, glide higher. Um, but that's an old Wall Street adage. Yeah, things do slide faster than they glide. Unfortunately, the short side can be tough too because you have sharp retrace rallies. And sooner or later, we're going to see the mother of all updates, and that's why we've been scaling out of that portfolio. Yeah, we'll take a look at that in one second. Um, be happy to. <laughs> Don, are you really a transmission mechanic retired? That's right, you are. I forgot about that. Yeah, you had uh, you had a shop and uh, you had to learn how to how to you you your guy quit on you, did you? Interesting. Okay. Okay. Yeah, Joe, thanks for waiting patiently. I promise to get you a question in just a few minutes. Let me just get through this uh, next couple of points. Um, here's the thing. You have a brain in your head, okay? Use it. And I think sometimes with markets, you could use just a little common sense, provided that you have your emotions in check. So provided that you're good at following your methodology. You have a discipline in place. You're good at honoring your stops at the times when they need to be honored. Then you could sometimes squeeze out a little bit more profits with discretion. And sometimes you can stay with a losing trade for an extra few cents. I'm not saying let it go against you, throw caution to the wind, let it go against you 50%, 100%, okay? But I'm saying sometimes – an extra few cents or a few percent, whatever the case may be, given a certain situation, you could stay with a trade. Now, here's a good problem to have. This was the AIZ trade. Now, this was the first half, and we were looking for a profit target of 72. Now, notice that I put 72 in here in the portfolio, and it's now no longer highlighted. That means that, okay, this hit the profit target, so I take it out. Now, in reality, when this thing hit the profit target, this thing gap lower and then began, it hit the profit target and then it began to implode. Now, again, I've got a little video on my website that I did in real time. It's only like a minute or two long, minute and 46 seconds, I think, on this. But I wanted to elaborate today. When the market gaps lower and you're short or gaps higher and you're long, you got your half profits on a trade, and you're ready to lock and load on those, sometimes you can squeeze out a little bit of extra money. Now, this is a one-minute chart, so this is only like a couple of minutes of it bouncing around, hits the profit target, and then begins to implode. Now, IPT means initial profit target. So instead of cashing out right at that initial profit target, what you could do, because the market's imploding, the overall stock market's selling off, 
this stock's continuing to sell off. You could do three things to squeeze out a little bit of money. The first thing you could do is trail a stop intraday. So when it drops to, say, like 69 or whatever, you could bump that stop down to, let's say, 71, and then you make an extra point, okay? And then when it keeps dropping, you drop it down to 70, okay? And then it's so on and so forth. And either by the end of the day, you get stopped out at a much better profit, or you decide to exit market on close, okay? So that's the first thing you could do is trail that's trail intraday. The second thing you could do is a little game I call Play That's Enough. Now, the reason I'm calling them a game is, and this psychologically might not work for you, but for me it works, and it helps me out quite a bit. So whenever I try to, let's say I get stopped out of position, I used to cuss and fuss, and I still cuss and fuss, but a lot of times I'll just I'll just say that um, that John Adams' voice, uh, what's his name, Giovanni? No, uh, what's the guy that played Paul G of G of something that played uh, John Adams? You know, I say good day, sir, is what I'll say when I get stopped out, and I'll find myself laughing at myself when I used to drop f bombs. I still drop f bombs, but I kind of play these little games with myself, and I try to sometimes have, and it sounds kind of weird, but. I hope I'm not being too esoteric, but sometimes I feel like I have like an out-of-body experience where my hand is being forced to exit the trade or enter the trade or whatever the case may be. And I feel like I'm, my body's kind of doing these things almost mechanically to follow the system. Now, I don't want to confuse that with the discretion, but sometimes I know where the stop should be. Sometimes I know it should get out or get in, whatever the case may be. And sometimes, instead of trying to overthink it, I just automatically make that movement. And you and you, you do that, it's like exercising a muscle. The more you work it, the better you get at it, or you get the, um, what's called muscle memory, which doesn't actually exist according to scientists. Muscle memory is all in your head. Uh, but it's the same kind of thing. You just kind of have this, this, for lack of a better term, muscle memory to do what you should do. And that's why I kind of call it games. Because it's a little bit more fun and easier to play a game as it is to as the, as it is to than it is to follow a system which is all strict and, and you just you, you try to follow these rules and you're getting stressed out at all. But if you kind of make it a game, it's kind of like okay, how as a broker of mine used to say many years ago, he says, Dave, just play a game called Let's Make These Numbers Get Bigger, and then that makes it a lot of fun. Now, the second thing you can do, the second game you can play is you can play That's Enough, okay? Isn't there like a Price is Right thing or something where they play That's Enough, where the whole audience screams That's Enough? So let's say you're looking for 72 as your profit target, and all of a sudden it's down here at 68 or 69 or even 66. You could say, okay, you know what? I've squeezed at 66, I've squeezed an extra six points out of that trade, intraday that's enough that's a pretty good profit okay even if you only short 100 shares let's say you short 200 shares but you had you're taking that 100 share profit that's an extra 600 bucks a day 600 bucks is a lot of money you know what that is a year that's a hundred fifty thousand dollars a year annualized i know you're not supposed to play that game but it's a lot of money so if you if you're ahead by an extra six points, if you beat the system by six points, then by all means, there's nothing wrong with that play. That's enough. Okay. Now I'm a bit of a greedy bastard, so what I like to do is I ask myself, what would Ron Popeil do? And one thing you could do is you could set it and forget it, because that's what Ron Popeil would do. So you could you could put that stop in at your profit target and just let things unfold. And then by the end of the day, you could exit market on close, okay? Now, this is the easiest do-nothing thing to do. You could go about your life, save lives, and then sometimes by the end of the day, you'd be pleasantly surprised. Sometimes when I do this, I find that there, there will be these huge intraday retraces that I know if I'm sitting there watching every little tick, I would be taken out of. Now, once it gets down quite a bit, you might decide halfway through the day, well, let me just bump this stop down a little bit so I'll squeeze out an extra few points at worst if I get stopped out. And if the market absolutely implodes, then I'll exit at the end of the day and maybe squeeze out six or seven or 10 or 20 points, okay, out of the trade. So 
think of it as playing some games, and these are good. These are fun games to play when it comes to trading. Craig says, I like to use a really short-term RSI on those trades. Giamatti is his name, Paul Giamatti. Thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> oh, I ran a guy off with my, uh, are you going to look at some charts? It sounds like a psychological, psychology diatribe. Well, it's hard not to. Well, here's the thing, you know, Robert said that. I guess maybe Robert doesn't have these psychological demons um, that we all do. So, yeah, let's look at some charts. But he already left. So let's talk about Robert. Um, anyway, if you want the uh, foresight and hindsight service, you can go to this link here. This is still up in, uh, on the website. I don't know if there's any direct links to it on the website right now. Maybe in the getting started, uh, there is. Yeah, that's where it is. If you go to the front page, the little tricycle, um, I'm sorry, the little bike with the training wheels, uh, there's a link to this free service. So check that out if you get a chance. It follow along for a while, okay? And just take a long-term approach to the markets. All right, we'll hop into the markets for Robert uh, now that he's left us. Oh, uh, I do have a question to answer from Jill, and she's waited so patiently. Thank you. So I'm, I'm glad I didn't scare you away, Jill. Uh, Jill's question is, and I, ironically, I got this question, answered this question a couple days ago. Do you take into consideration the X dividend date when you go short? And my answer to that is no. Okay. And the, this answer is many fold, but one thing I'm just kind of thinking about is a lot of times dividend so small, it doesn't matter. Okay. So that's the first thing. The, the main answer is, let's say the stock is, um, let's say it has a $1 dividend, which would be big. I guess, depending on the price of stock. Well, what's going to happen after the next dividend date is that stock is going to drop by one point. So your short position goes up by $1. But Dave, don't we owe that dollar? Yeah, you owe the dollar, so it becomes a wash. Now, here's the beauty of it, and this is uh, one thing I emailed somebody. And this is fodder for research. And uh, if you go out and you find something here, you're welcome. Uh, just just give me a little bit of credit or send me half the money you make on it, if you don't mind. <laughs> and I think the system would be you short stocks before the X dividend day date. You pay that dividend, okay? And you break an even. And then guess what happens after people get their dividends? A lot of people, it's kind of like, wasn't there like a Seinfeld episode once where Elaine ate like nine really crappy sandwiches because her 10th, 10th sandwich was free? So people will hold on to a stock, even a crappy stock, just to get the dividend, like it's some sort of magical prize, and then they'll sell it. So I'd be willing to bet, especially when conditions are less than ideal, maybe you put in a filter without getting too complex, but saying, but the filter is the market must be below its 50-day moving average or the market must be the overall market, the, the S&P 500 must be below its 50-day moving average or something. And then the system is, okay, I'm going to short a stock that's getting ready to pay a big dividend right before the ex-dividend date, and then I'm going to cover or I'm going to trail a stop lower after the dividend because there's going to be some additional selling coming in. So ignore the dividends is what I'm trying to say. Daphne says, why is he running off? <laughs> I don't know. We might experience a great lesson this year in the psychology of trading short in 2016. Thank you. Okay. All right. Jill says, okay, thanks. You're welcome, Jill. The great question. I enjoyed that. Or answer none, I should say. Okay. I, I've heard you say that you don't like to trade shorts and that some traders refuse to trade shorts. Why? It's not that I don't like to trade shorts, okay? The problem with the short side is the covering rallies can be really tough. And that's why you have to be um, vigilant or diligent. 
you have to make sure you're following a sound money management plan. And if you look at the portfolio, obviously we have taken partial profits. Now, some people may argue, oh, Dave, your position is the smallest when the trend ensues. Well, so what? Who cares? Okay. So we took partial profits, I guess over here. Let me just circle those. So again, about $1,000 is what we're looking for in the first loaf per 100K. And then hopefully the second loaf becomes something much, much bigger. Okay. And so far, knock on wood, it has. Unfortunately, though, sooner or later, we're going to have to give up some of those open gains. But maybe this this $2,000 or roughly $2,000 here will be $3,000 and then we give up $500 of that. Okay. And then we're back up $3,500 or whatever. There's going to be a big retrace rally. So on the short side, there's a couple of problems. Obviously, there's logistics involved. And I don't want to get too far into this because we're running out of time because I have talked about it quite a bit. But there's logistics involved. You have to borrow the shares. That's why you're going to have to make sure the shares to borrow. The shares can be called back. If that happens, there's things you could do. We don't have time to get into that today. Uh, see by the YouTubes because I talked about that before. And then the retrace rallies make it tough. Obviously, you could only make 100% on the position, but you could also sometimes swing trade around the positions. Now, this is something that I don't actually – recommend directly in the service but sometimes i'll say guys this thing is set up again if you want to put some shares on or it, to, for those of you who missed the trade entirely so when you have something that let's say something sells off and retraces you can reshort it and then if you get lucky and i hate to use the word lucky you might be able to do that several times so instead of just making a hundred percent if it goes to zero you can make a lot more than a hundred percent of the short but obviously the quick answer is, one, you can only make 100%. Two, there's mechanics involved. Three, the retrace rally sucks. So that's pretty much a nutshell on why. Uh, but, again, I try to be careful not to say, oh, I hate shorts. Like I, I did the lecture a few weeks ago. You got to love the trend you're in. So it's not that I hate shorts. I feel like sometimes I have to apologize to people for shorting. Okay? But that's not me saying, oh, I hope this uh, – company fails, that's just me saying, I think this market is going down and I'm going to sell it short. Now, if you think about a short, you're just promising to buy it later. You're not doing anything wrong, right? You're just, you're following the rules. You promise to buy the stock later. So you're just, you're just a future buyer of that stock. That's what you are. <laughs> Craig says, the story of my life, Pet even gave up waiting for me. Very good. How do you capture a trend? Well, you find something like a pullback or a uh, one of my little stocks setups that I like to trade. And when it happens, you get on board. OK, watch the uh, watch the video at the bottom of my website. I'll show you that right here. I'll go here and then scroll down to the bottom or you can get it under blog. But go all the way down here. Look, five great setups during the bear market of 2016 and why I picked them. So this is how you get on a trend. Okay. Candle doji. I don't know what that is. No, I know what it is. I don't use candles. That that says emotionally shorting is the hardest trade to put on. It seems un-American until you cash in the profits from the trade. Well, it's not an American and trust me, it's not. And you're taking on, you, you might feel like it's un-American. You might feel guilty for making money. But the first time you get caught in a big short covering rally where you're losing your ass, you will get over those feelings fast, okay? You get paid to put money in harm's way, to put capital in harm's way. That's how you get paid. So, yeah, absolutely, get over it. All right, I want to cover a few things real quick in the overall markets. Keep the questions coming. Uh, they're great, man. Um, let's just look at the overall market real quick. And as you know, I like to start with a micro and work my way out to the macro. Uh, on a micro level, obviously the S&P 500 down today. Let's take a look at the um, spider. So we get a true open. So we're down over a percent and a half. Now let's go back to the cash. And at these levels, and I know they ain't over yet, but at these levels, we're way down here around this magical 1800 level. Not that there's anything magical about it, but. It's well watched, obviously. And if we measure the market going back in time, you could see that on a net-net basis, 
we can go all the way back to 2014. Now, guess what? I bet we can go back to 2013. Look at that. Look at that. Okay. Sounded like Tiny Elvis. Anybody remember Tiny Elvis? Look at that. Look at that lamp. It's huge. So we go back to 2013. 2013! Almost three years ago. Okay. Is my math right on that? Anyway, it's got a three in it. I know that. No, not quite. But anyway, two and a half years ago, whatever it is. So we can go back to 2013, and now we're lower now based on where we are at this particular moment in time. So never forget about the net net change. The other thing you got to remember is everyone who bought during this range is now beginning to question their investments. I had a friend of a friend call me a few days ago and say, where can I go get some information on the markets? And I'm like, you can go to my website. <laughs> you have a website? Yeah. <laughs> um, because they started investing last year. Now they're underwater. And now they're concerned about things. Okay. So that's, that's kind of like the last people in the market. And then anybody who invested prior to that late 2013 is now having to look at their portfolio. They not only lost open profits, but now as the market drops more and more, they might actually be turning into open losses. So it's not just the people who invested in 2015. It's the people who invested in 2014 and then now some people in 2013. So never forget about net net change when it comes to the markets. So that does not look good, folks. I hate when people say that, folks, but I find myself saying it lately for some strange reason. Anyway, we did have the bow tie. I'm not going to beat the dead horse on that. Uh, it triggered, and then the market had this one little throwback. And this is where I got some nasty grabs from people telling me how stupid I was. But that's okay. I just said it wasn't like I was rushing out shorting the world at this point. I just wasn't buying anything new and say we should be prudent. And I think that was a smart thing to do so far. We'll see. And again, not to beat the dead horse, the last two major bow tie signals were a win, 2000 and in 2007. Okay. So actually triggered in 2008, but way up here, market dropped about 40 something percent from that. And then a 30, 40% slide, whatever it was back here. So we could have a long ways to go, folks. <laughs> there it is again. Uh, NASDAQ, same sort of action going on there too. This is that 70% drop I talked about. Can you believe it? I mean, how crazy is this? 70 something percent drop in an index. So markets go up, markets go down. This is how you survive as a trader longer term. You don't rush in and buy the NASDAQ when it's down 50% because it's cheap. Okay. As I often say, it's always darkest right before it gets more dark. You also don't sell a market because it's high. You wait for some sort of signal that it might be turning. Okay. And then, of course, we have a bow tie sell signal on a weekly basis in the NASDAQ, okay, right here. And this is like a kind of like a double bow tie sell signal. And as I've said before, the early bird gets the worm, second mouse gets the cheese. Sometimes you get those second signals, then you get a really big move develop. Now, let's take a look at the Rusty. The Rusty just looks absolutely abysmal. And it's down a little bit over a percent and a half so far today. And again, the net net change, vitally important to look at. Okay. And again, nothing magical about technical analysis. And you go all the way back to what, 2013, just like the P's now, or this was down here long before the P's. And by the way, by media measurements, uh, we're down close to 30%. What's, what's the media call a bear market 20%? So this Rusty has been in a bear market for a long, long time. Let's take a look at the P's. Where are the P's now? Let's go back to that peak last summer. Only 14%. So we still got another few percent to go before it's officially a bear market. Um, in the sectors, one of my concerns is some of these areas that longer term at relatively higher levels, such as real estates, these REITs, are beginning to break down. If you look at some of the individual REITs, you can see they're really beginning to implode in here. This, in spite of rates being pretty uh, pretty low, uh, notice that bonds have been going straight up as of late. By the way, it's good to see a little bit of flight to safety in this market. We've been seeing bonds go higher, and uh, this is the stuff Robert was waiting for, and he already left. It's a shame. 
Um, how do we feel about Robert? No, anyway, <laughs> so the bonds are going higher. So it's good to see a little flight to safety. When you see a market, and, and write this down, if you ever see a market, and we've seen this, I think in some recent times, but longer term as you study markets, if you ever see a market where gold goes down and bonds go down and the market goes down, that's a market where people are throwing the baby out with the bathwater, and that's a pretty scary market to be in. That's what's known as a liquidation market, okay? And if you survive long enough, you'll get to see one. You might get to see one later this year. But the fact that bonds are, are headed higher, that's somewhat of a good thing. It means that there's a little flight to safety in the market. Gold is headed higher, too. So I just pointed out gold's going up. Let's take a look at gold. As you can see, gold popping up nicely in here. So at least gold is getting a bit of a bid in here. It's been kind of hard getting on these gold stocks because we've had so much overhead supply to deal with. But lately, I've been looking for um, a few golds to get into and also a few metals and mining stocks. Let's take a look at the M&Ms in here. There we go. Uh, M&Ms are looking... Uh, decent in here you can see they've kind of bottomed out they made a thrust from lows now beginning to bow tie so that's the first sign that market uh, metals and mining might be turning overall okay uh, the sector actually has no sense going through all the sectors because most look pretty much abysmal most look like the overall market itself the only other thing i would like to point out other than gold and metals and mining and um i think that's pretty much it for now most sectors look pretty bad. What's scary, as I would say quite a bit, is these sectors at high levels are beginning to implode. And notice that, remember last week or week before, I was talking about when retail goes, as with the market, well, guess what happened? Retail imploded, so did the market. Doesn't always work out that way, but you have to pay attention to the signals and the signs. The other thing that's kind of concerning is these big cap stocks in here. We came in today with Netflix set up, Starbucks set up. And quite a few other of these big cap stocks. Amazon already cracked. I've been talking about it quite a bit as of late, okay? As these big cap stocks begin to crack, and go back and watch the lectures from weeks past where I showed you how those big cap stocks were propping up the entire market. Once those stocks that have actual fundamentals begin getting sold, that's when you're in, I hate to use the term again, but that's when you're in a bit of a, a liquidation market uh, where people are raising capital, okay? So, Take a look at that. And by the way, uh, I think Phil pointed out a while back, getting back to that question about institutions, uh, Apple is owned by over 5,000 institutions, okay? So as, let's say, some individuals own some Apple, which they do, they begin selling Apple. That's going to make Apple's price go down. That's going to make the price of those funds go down. And if people begin selling those funds for whatever reason, then they're going to have to sell their Apple to raise some cash to pay the people, okay? My year was just made when I had a straddle on LinkedIn earnings. I did 215 calls at 170 puts. Well, I'm not a big fan of that strategy, but again, if you're going to make, if you're going to make options your thing, then make it your thing. Uh, I'll give a shout out to my friend Larry McMillan, who I'm going to see um, not this Sunday, but I'll see him next Sunday at Traders Expo. If you're going to make options your thing, then, then I would say learn from the best. Learn from Larry McMillan. And I don't know if he has some sort of earnings play thing, but I know he does look at some IVs and, and has some interesting ways of doing some things with options. Then by all means, make that your deal. It's not my cup of tea, uh, although – uh, you could use in the buddy options on the short side. Uh, email me, I'll send you the ch chapter from my first book on that. The markets may be bad, but I uh, sleep like a baby. Every hour I wake up and cry. <laughs> well, learn how to short, Howard. Let me know what it costs to sponsor the show. Oh, Craig, I'll make you a good deal. You're a you're a client of mine. <laughs> be happy to. Uh, utilities for safety higher too. Yeah, Jim, good point. Um, that's kind of interesting that uh, utilities, the problem I've noticed with utilities is in more recent years, I haven't found them to be as much of a flight to safety. But yeah, I agree with you. Utilities have been headed higher 
as of late. Let me look at the major big groups. We'll take a look at those real quick, and then we'll hop into it. Start asking about individual stocks because I know I went long today. And we, uh, I'll go a few extra minutes because of the problem earlier. Let's see if I can find utilities in here. So, yeah, good point about that. I haven't seen any setups of utilities just yet. I'm not really crazy about trading utilities, but utilities have worked their way higher as of late, as you can see. But they're kind of wide and loose in here, so I'm having a hard time getting too excited about them. Give a latte. That is what I said at Starbucks. Okay, Phil says you can only make 100% on a short. Right, but if you reshort, you can make more than that. Shorts backstop the market. That's an interesting point. Uh, that's a that's a really good interesting point, Craig. Thanks for saying that. Uh, shorts backstop a market. So, not that I want to get into a debate with someone whether shorts are good or bad, but. As I said earlier, in shorting, pent up buying. So every time somebody shorts the market, that's some buying that's going to happen down the road. And that buying is going to help the market out eventually. So, yeah, shorts backstop a market. I hear you. Good point. Research has found short covering rallies are off of the spikes that stall bull markets. Let's start bull markets. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, see, you need some sort of catalyst to get things going. And if and the shorts are a very fickle bunch, if they all start running for the door at the same time, it's going to buoy that market higher. And then sometimes that buying begets more buying. Absolutely. Good point. Weak dollar, weak market, weak all prices defines all economic logic. Not so. Um, for Chris Raj, I hope I'm saying your name right. I, I could barely—I don't have my glasses with me. I could barely read the um, the fonts, and they don't allow me to put the LE font in, which is much bigger. Uh, don't don't confuse the issue with facts. If you try to put all the pieces together, do study intermarket technical analysis, do learn about it, but don't try to put the pieces together because you could have really long lead and lag cycles. Okay. Um, Weak dollar is supposed to be good for commodity prices, okay? But that's not always the case. But as a general statement, yes, that works. Strong dollar makes commodity prices go down because they're dollar denominated. Um, you can start putting together all the pieces, but the, the problem you're going to find is you can't time off of it. And this is especially true in more recent times. Many years ago, you used to be able to, predict stocks off bonds and vice versa. In fact, I've got a bar, I've got a book here somewhere where some guy uh, wrote a book, and that's all he did was he just day traded bonds versus stocks and vice versa. Um, that doesn't work anymore, okay? What I have found with these intermarket technical relationships is they only matter when they matter. So if you do find something that's positively correlated or negatively correlated and you find it's working, that's fine. Use it to your advantage but realize that they can decouple for a long, long time. And I think it's very hard to time a market longer term off of intermarket technical analysis, okay? But Dave, you're looking at bonds, you're looking at gold. Yeah, and I'm looking at these markets in and of themselves. And when it matters, it matters. And sometimes we do kind of put the pieces together a little bit, but we got to be careful not to rush out and make that our entire model, okay? Look at everything is what I say. Or are you concerned about Netflix doing a false start? The weeklies and the monthlies have outran the trend line quickly. I feel the retrace is very near around the corner before longer term play is available. What do you think? Um, well, on the short side, I think you have to go with with dailies first and stick to what the dailies say. Oh, Dave, you're short a weekly S&P. Bowtie. Yeah, I got this question last week. The weekly S&P bow tie happened after a daily S&P bow tie. I didn't sit around and wait for a weekly S&P bow tie to say, oh, yeah, market might be in trouble. I saw some stocks beginning to come unglued and a lot of different things happen. So he's concerned about the weekly and the monthly. Well, I would just look at the daily and ask yourself what's going on, okay? And you had a bow tie back here, and then it 
fell hard out of the bow tie. Now it's pulling back again, setting up for a new leg lower. That's the only thing I would be looking at with Netflix. But if you do want to look at a weekly, I hear you, okay? Uh, you could have a weekly bow tie working soon. The only problem with waiting for that weekly bow tie is this market might be way down here by by the time you get that bow tie. Sometimes bow ties are wonderful, especially like in the S&P. When the S&P just gradually rolled over, you got a nice little weekly bow tie here kind of warning you this thing's rolling over, and then it rolls over. But sometimes the market just implodes, and that bow tie takes a while to catch up. So be careful with any indicator, even something as wonderful as my bow tie pattern. Is this the bow tie entry in PSA? It could be. Uh, that's one that's been on the radar. That's a REIT, and I do like it. I probably should be talking about it because it was in my Landry list last night. Uh, but, yes, it is. But see, with today's rally, okay, uh, and then my entry on this one would have been pretty low, maybe even below this low here, not this low, but this low here. Okay. we got another one we're looking at in the reach today, but see how it faked out a little bit. So make sure you wait for an entry. And if it does rally up to up here or something, you can bump that entry up a little bit, but I would use a liberal entry, um, on something like this. And then also, Make sure you have some shares to short. Again, that's a logistic things we talked about earlier. Okay. <laughs> Phil says, M, guess where? What, 50-day moving average? Yeah, it's Macy's. Um, yeah, I would prefer, even though it's down here in multi-year lows, I'd prefer if this was like 10-year lows or something. But I hear you, Phil. It's, uh, it's, it's broken out, pulled back to its 50 and Phil thinks it looks like a bottom. I think it looks like a bottom, too. I can't argue with you. Uh, it does have some overhead supply. So based on the fact that it's not coming off of, like, 10-year lows, and, and not that I wouldn't trade a stock if it was, not that I would wait for 10-year lows, but ideally you want it to be coming off of major, major lows. Number two, you don't want any overhead supply. And number three, what's the market doing, okay? I'm not going to rush out and buy a retail stock just yet with the market as funky as it is, I might buy a, a gold stock or a metals and a mining stock because they could trade contra to the market and the overall sector is going up. What's retail doing right now? It's beginning to implode. So I'd stay away from retail for now. Oh, you got to short it. Don't go long. Okay. Uh, yeah, but it's above. Should it be hitting the 50 and rolling over? Phil sometimes likes to let's take a look at AIZ. Uh, Sometimes Phil likes to short right here when you get a nice little drop below the 50 and you get a little retrace back up to it. That's what Phil likes to go in and short. And then looks like it worked out pretty good on AIZ so far. Getting excited about MOH's rally. It looks like a new entry point is imminent within the next trading days. What do you think? Well, let's take a look at it. Um, the only thing I don't like about this one for establishing a new position, now I'm kind of going to talk out of both sides of my mouth, is that it, it's, it, it doesn't really have this uh, – well, I guess it does if you back the chart out. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, you could get, a, you could get a, a short side set up here soon. But it would have to rally up quite a bit. Now, on the shorts, especially those shorts that are in more established downtrends, what I want to see now is I want to see um, a bit of this this sharp retrace, this witch's hat pattern. I want to see that occur. That's up. That's that's in my second book. I prefer these on the short side as opposed to long side. But yeah, I hear you. How about Apple Long? I would I would if Apple was a buy, I would be flabbergasted at this point in time. No. No. See, why would you buy? See, human nature never changes. Why would you want to buy Apple? Because it's cheap. Well, you know, it was cheap at 120, cheap at 110, cheap at 100. It's gonna be cheaper at 90, cheaper, <laughs> cheaper at 80. Uh, as long as the big blue arrow points down, and I'll help you draw those if you need a little lessons. I would leave it alone. Not to pick on you, Joe, but it's just it, it doesn't fit my methodology. All right, Craig says Fed raises rates. Bonds should go lower, but they don't. They go up much higher. Why? Okay. I don't want to put on my economic head because, you know, economist is going to tell you tomorrow or what they predicted yesterday didn't come true today, but something's wrong, okay? Something's wrong. When a market doesn't behave as it should, 
something's wrong. Not that it can't, you know, get out of whack here and there. But if bonds are going up and Fed's raised rates, something's wrong. It means that there's a demand for bonds. Something's wrong. Is there deflation? I don't know. I'm not going to worry about that, but something's wrong. And then Craig goes on to say, China mucks up your intermarket analysis by selling foreign reserves of U.S. dollars. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I don't know. That's, you know, like Douglas said, all it takes is one a-hole to screw up a perfectly good trade. The world's a complex place. That's why I like to just look at the charts and say, is it going up or is it going down or is it going sideways? Okay. PHM, that's going to be a, a, a REIT, I think, or a pharmaceutical. Yeah, it's a, it's a home builder, actually. Um, I'm not seeing a setup. I do see your top, though. Uh, it's certainly a top if you back the chart way out. But I'm not really seeing a setup. It's kind of choppy and all over the place. And then here's your, your low. You've got too many days in here and to pull back for to establish a new position. But I hear you. Okay. How comfortable are you with the utility stocks going long? Very nervous, putting on those trades, scared that they will be liquidated quickly to pay for losses in other sectors. Yeah, that's kind of in the back of my mind. Um, I'm having a hard time getting excited about anything right now on the long side, except something that can trade contra to the overall market like a commodity, okay? Gold is kind of melting up in here, no pun intended. So I'm more excited about a gold stock or a silver stock than I would be a utility. And I'll trade anything that moves, but I'm going to keep my skeptical hat on for those utilities. And as I said, that little video I did a couple days ago, it's on my website. I let the database, or it's on YouTube at least, I let the database tell me what to do. By the way, join my YouTube channel when you get a chance and you'll, you'll get access to all these videos. Sometimes I don't get around to put them on website or something. They get buried on my website. So make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel. And I'm, I promise I'm going to start doing more and more video updates. I'm, I'm still working on a few kinks in my uh, studio, in my office, but it's coming along very nicely. And the videos that are coming out are decent. They're, they're, they could be better, but they're decent. Okay, it could always be better. Apple was a great short at 50, trades back as well and retraces. Okay, that's the fill way of trading. And I don't can't disagree with you because uh, I don't particularly see it in Apple. I see it in MOH, the retrace back to the 50. Phil says R, that's going to be Rider, which is going to be um, a transport. Now, right now, I'm not as excited about second tier. We did take, I think, the uh, the DY was a second second leg type of setup uh, we, that we took. But I'd much rather prefer, ideally, I want to try to find stocks like somewhere up in here or here before they break down. And somebody asked me last week, at what point will we start taking those second tier setups or those trend resumption type of setups? And the answer to that is uh, fairly soon because now the market is down so low, it's becoming harder and harder to find stocks at high levels. The last of those Mohicans looks like it's the REIT in selected retail. But uh, at this juncture, I'm still trying to find something at higher levels. So I'm not quite ready to go after something that's already in a longer term established downtrend. But I hear you, Phil. It's in trouble. It certainly is. Oh, is, is PSA a bow tie? Yeah. But but in PSA's cage, PSA, um, it's a bit of a what I call a forced bow tie. When you have uh, a bow tie, ideally, is something that um, that happens on a more gradual basis. It sort of it sort of sold off really hard. It did form a bow tie by going sideways. But this sharp sell-off completed it. So, yeah, it's a bow tie. It's also a first thrust. Uh, sometimes with a bow tie, though, it might stay at these higher levels for a while before the actual bow tie forms. And once a market begins to implode, it forces that bow tie to form. But, yeah, the, it doesn't matter what you call it. It's a stock that's in trouble, whether you call it a bow Don't get caught up in semantics too much, whether it's a bow tie or a um, first thrust. Don's been waiting patiently for Lulu. No, if you look at the buy, it's got too much overhead supply. I mean, it's just got a ton of – anybody who bought in this range might be looking to get out of break even, so stay away from that. What is a bow tie? Leon, uh, go to my website and go to education, 
and also uh, YouTube channel and search my videos. I have plenty of videos in it. Uh, do you you see the gatekeeper up there, mean guy? Gatekeeper? Uh, where? Susan says, morning, dream boy. ACC REIT starting rollover question mark. Hello, Susan. Uh, no, I don't really see it in. No, this is kind of too wide and loose. I mean, you know, you take a look at something like PSA. And to those who are in a delayed service in about a week, you'll see the one we're going after today. Um, a little bit cleaner setup. Kind of came up here, topped out, made all-time highs on a fake out, and then sold off hard. Okay. Are oh, you talking about S&P 500? Gatekeeper? On what time frame? S&P 500? Um, sort of on a weekly, I guess, because you had that. But it's I would call that more of a, a, a failed double top. Or even a head and shoulders top, you want to call it that. But usually, as I said before, with a double top, they stall well short of the prior top and then implode. Or sometimes they overshoot a little bit to fake people out. Rarely does it ever. Uh, no, no, I wouldn't call that a, a gatekeeper just because it overshot it a little bit too much. But it still looks toppy, so it doesn't matter what you call it. Okay, Joe wants to know about DRD. We're going to have to wrap it up soon. DRD. I don't know what the software is. Uh, let's see. Yeah, only problem with these goals is since they took off so much, I'd like to see a little bit more of a pullback. They've been hard to get on. Um, sometimes it's hard to get on the trend. W y O R W. I don't know that. Y O R W. Never heard of it. Yeah, too thin. That's way too thin. No, we can't uh, be careful with that. It's just uh, I mean, I hear you. It's going up, but it's too dangerous and too thin to trade. I'd stay away from that. All right, I'd have a good day. How much pullback do you want to get in uh, on GLD? Well, since it's going straight up in here, I'd like to see a pretty deep retracement, okay? But it has, like, plowed through a lot of this overhead supply, so this is a pretty exciting thing now. It does have longer-term uh, resistance, but I wouldn't worry about that as much now that it's past its short-term resistance. So... Yeah, I would have to have a pretty serious knockout, maybe below 115, maybe completely close this gap or whatever. Um, you know, it's kind of like, a, what's his name, Potter Stewart? Stewart. I know it when I see it. Okay, uh, Donson waiting patiently for Smith & Wesson, SWHC. Love the guns, hate the stock. Uh, you know, on a relative strength basis, it's doing okay, but you can't live off relative strength. I think I'd avoid it. On the short side and the long side, because short side's got support. Long side's just, eh, you know, it's kind of shot higher. No pun intended, it came back in. We had this as a potential long not too long ago, and we took it off right before it took off, which, you know, womp womp, it happens. Trust me. All right. Uh, I guess we're running out of time here. Better go ahead and close things down. Uh, anyway, I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time and busy schedule to be here. Sorry for the technical difficulties and uh, but um, hopefully we'll get that ironed out before next week. If we don't talk again, everybody have a fantastic weekend. And if you have any unanswered questions, David, Dave Lander com. a little backed up lately, especially with uh, Traders Expo coming up and uh, website development and all this other stuff. Plus the markets have been crazy too. So uh, just give me a few days to get back with you. Uh, but anyway, everybody have a fantastic weekend. We'll talk again and then uh, hope to see all you guys again next week. Thank you so much.